Taiwan has never been at war with the USA, nor was it even invaded during the Second World War, even though it was host to a large number of important Japanese bases. But its inhabitants somehow became important enough to begin the process of compiling a doctrine which became known as the Small Wars Manual, created by and adopted by the United States Marine Corps in 1940. And this manual became the go-to handbook on how to conduct limited engagements all over the globe since then. So how did that come to be? Despite having long been cast as wild, bloodthirsty, head-hunting, savages and even cannibals, lacking a written language of their own, these people never or seldom had a chance to tell their side of their story. And I'm talking about Taiwan's indigenous aboriginals here, not the USMC. Back in the 1860s, a, an unruly band of foreigners set themselves upon the destruction of a group of Taiwanese indi indigenes known as the Kaolut or Kaolut who uh, lived in uh, what's now the uh, Hong Chun Peninsula in the south of Taiwan. We don't have any reason for, we don't have any motive for their attack, but they attacked and killed several or even dozens of warriors and this started a vicious cycle of revenge that ended in uh, quite a tragedy. On March 12th of that year, an American merchant ship named the Rover, en route from Shanto to Inko, was blown off course in strong weather and shipwrecked off the southern tip of Taiwan. At that time, there was no lighthouse here. Off of the southern tip of the island, the ship struck a coral reef called Qi Xing Yan, or Seven Stars, which is near Balambi, the site of the current lighthouse. And this is a cluster of seven pinnacles, um, two of which are above water at high tide and all seven are above water at low tide. And they managed to wreck themselves on there back then in 1867. Now we are at the very southernmost tip of Taiwan. So during a tidal exchange, of course, you have basically the whole Pacific trying to surge around uh, the island and um, the currents here are so strong that there, are, there have been a great number of divers um, who've been swept off of that dive site to the point where now there's only one or two local shops will actually take any divers out there at all. It's, it's just considered um, too risky. It's an amazing site, but uh, very few people are now willing to uh, take the risk to go out there. So you can just imagine how bad of a day it was for the crew of the rover. The rover came off of the reef but was holed and taking on water and the captain decided to abandon ship. And through no small amount of effort they managed to row themselves ashore or at least one of the crews managed to row a dinghy ashore and finally wash up uh, on the shoreline. It's a distance of about 10 kilometers um, or what's that seven nautical miles uh, from Qi Xin Yen to the shore so you can see the breakers with the naked eye and it's and it's not on the horizon uh, and that took them 17 hours sadly for the crew of this boat they had landed to the east of what was known as Kaolut Rock which is known in Chinese as Chuan Fan Shi and this marked the boundary of Kaolut territory the occupants of the first boat, which included the captain and his wife, flopped down exhausted on the shoreline. A half an hour later, they were shot at with muskets, the fire coming from the tree line above the shore. 
The sole survivors, two Chinese men, hid themselves until the shooting stopped and then escaped to the Chinese village of Lianqiao, which is modern-day Hongchun. From there, they managed to get to Takao, which is modern-day Kaohsiung, to raise the alarm about the fate of the rover. And the rest were not so lucky. The rest were shot and killed, and the, the story is that they were eaten. There in Takao, upon hearing this terrible story, one Captain Broad of HMS Cormorant decided to set sail immediately to try to rescue any survivors by paying ransom, and that was considered normal at the time. Along for the ride were one Mr. Carroll, the acting British consul to Takao, and a Dr. Manson. They arrived at the scene to search for survivors, to also be met with musket fire, and wisely withdrew to their ships. And the mission now switched from one of search and rescue into a punitive raid. The ships returned fire and seemed to score hits on their Kaolut attackers, given the cries and the cessation of gunfire from the shore. They did not, however, manage to kill or incapacitate that many of the Kaolut. The response to this failure was an attempt by the American consul to Amoy, which is now known as Shaman, to attempt to convince the Qing authorities to extract a promise from the Aborigines that in the event of a further shipwreck, the survivors be treated with a little less savagery. General Charles W. Legendre retired, attempted to communicate with the Kaolut tribe, but was ignored. He then went to Chinese officialdom to elicit their help with little more success. The top Qing official on Taiwan answered that this area was outside their jurisdiction, and we hear this kind of language from the Qing court uh, on many occasions, that Taiwan is Guan Wai, or over the passes, out of our control. The Qing official had to say, the uncivilized Aborigines are beyond the imperial domain and the realm of our civilization. The foreigners are advised to obey the boundary policy and not to venture into the forbidden Aboriginal territory. Running round to visit the governor of Fujian province, which nominally controlled Taiwan, he got pretty much the same answer. Again, the Kaolut's tribe is located in the Aboriginal territory, and the murderers are the uncivilized Aborigines. They are not Chinese people. The territory is beyond the imperial domain and the capacity of our military authority. It is really difficult to meet the American request. At this point, the Qing court had not realized Taiwan's strategic importance, although Japan's had. Three months passed before the War Department issued any further orders. Remember that at this time, the US Navy only comprised about 90 ships. Admiral Bell of the Far Eastern Fleet assembled two warships, the steam sloops USS Hartford and Wyoming, with a detachment of 181 marines and placed them under the command of one flag captain, Belknap. The ship set sail and arrived in Kanding on June the 19th of 1867. Captain Belknap landed his forces under the command of a Lieutenant Commander Mackenzie with the intent of tracking down and punishing the Cowlett tribe. Despite the passing of three months, there does not seem to have been much of a plan or strategy in place. They followed an insane strategy of blindly plowing into the jungle in search of expert woodsmen intimately familiar with their land and how to survive in it. Worse yet, they didn't even know which tribe it was that they were supposed to extract revenge upon. Hacking through the jungle in blistering heat and high humidity, many of the marines simply fell victim to heat exhaustion and heat stroke. 
The Cowlet practiced excellent guerrilla tactics like firing from cover and then quickly moving to new positions before counterattacks could be mounted, use of ambushes, etc., just standard guerrilla tactics. Although the Marines did manage to kill some of the Cowlet warriors with their superior breech loading weapons, they also killed non combatants, further enraging the Indigenes. When Mackenzie fell to a gunshot wound, the fight was completely knocked out of the Marines, and they hastily withdrew. Rather than putting any fear into the Cowlet to actually dissuade them from attacking any more shipwreck victims, the failure to kill all of them only hardened the posture of the majority that survived the American attack. Upon hearing of these events, Legendre took stock of the situation and reasoned that Belknap had badly miscalculated that 181 Marines would be a sufficient force and that the job could be done without local support or assistance. He decided that two things would be necessary to convince the Cowlet to stop molesting shipwreck victims. First, a negotiating strategy would be more successful than one of punishment. Second, a much larger show of force would help them with their negotiating position. To this end, Legendre of his own accord obtained permission to travel to Taiwan from the governor of Fujian and an introductory letter to be given to the prefect. The letter that he got, however, did entrain local authorities not to allow Legendre to take matters into his own hands, fearing that he'd be captured or killed by the Kaolut. He commissioned the privateer ship The Volunteer and traveled to Takao, telling his superiors that he was going to Taiwan merely as a spectator. In Takao, he appointed a deputy consul for the north of Taiwan, and while there, began assembling a force of 1,800 Chinese regular soldiers and mercenaries. With the aid of one Mr. William Pickering, an employee of Messrs. Ellison Company in Taiwan Fu, or modern-day Tainan, who spoke Chinese, Legendre set out at the head of a column of troops. To set the tone for the mission, he wore the clothes of a diplomat, not a military uniform. Legendre had been a general in the Civil War and had learned how to understand enemy combatants, their sensibilities, how to negotiate with them. In the Orient, he'd also learned to work with people from other cultures as a diplomat. Whilst he did not have a direct mandate from the State Department for this task, he's exactly the sort of person that these days you'd expect to be sent in parallel with a military response. Landing in Fangliao, they went to the trouble of constructing a road over the pass on the ridge above the bay, holding that vantage point secure while the forces were mustered on the plain below. Fang Liao at the time was paying tribute to Toki Tok, the leader of the 18 southern Paiwan tribes of, of Taiwan, in the form of a portion of the rice, sugar, sweet potatoes, etc. that were grown on the fertile plain there. Legendre then strode into Cowlet territory at the head of an undefeatable force, all the while spreading the word via his interpreter that he was there to negotiate. He simply put the leader of the Paiwan tribes into a position where it was far easier to do that than to resist. Legendre was, in his own words, willing to sacrifice a vain revenge, which might hereafter be used as a pretext for retaliation to the incomparable advantage we would gain in securing ourselves against the recurrence of crimes we had come to punish. The reason the Cowlet had murdered the crew of the rover in the first place was that years earlier a group of foreigners had killed a number of their tribesmen and they had therefore taken revenge when the opportunity presented itself. All it took to persuade Toki Tok to break the cycle was to ask him politely for free passage to be given to mariners who would wave a red flag to show that they were in distress and harmless, and the display of the necessary force to wipe out the tribe if the treaty wasn't adhered to. The Marine Corps took these lessons learned from the Rover incident and those from numerous other engagements, and in the 1930s wrote this manual called the Small Wars Manual. 
This work explains the doctrine developed from those experiences and the way to fight and to win small wars. Small wars are defined as operations undertaken under executive authority with it wherein military force is combined with diplomatic pressure in the internal or external affairs of another state whose government is unstable, inadequate or unsatisfactory for the preservation of life and of such interests as are determined by the foreign policy of our nation. Though it does hold the tactics on how to physically fight the battles necessary to win against an armed opponent, the chapters on psychology and diplomacy are much more enlightening. This paragraph illustrates the lesson taught by the mission undertaken by the British team on the Cormorant. Drastic punitive measures to induce surrender or action in the nature of reprisals may awaken sympathy against the Marines. Reprisals and punitive measure may result in the destruction of lives and property of innocent people and have an adverse effect on the Marines who must carry out those measures. It's pretty clear that Lieutenant Commander McKenzie would call being shot dead in the line of duty an adverse effect. But since both the British and First American expeditions were punitive in design, both could only have ended in such violence. Strategic emphasis on parallel diplomatic efforts is made clear in this paragraph. The aim is not to develop a belligerent spirit in our men, but one of caution and steadiness. Instead of employing force, one strives to accomplish the purpose by diplomacy, all the while preventing, as far as possible, any casualties among our own troops. The chapter on strategy makes it clear that small wars can and do occur in parallel with the diplomatic effort, but for this to happen there must actually be an attempt at diplomacy at work. The military leader in small wars is limited to certain lines of action as to the strategy and even as to the tactics of the campaign. This feature has been so marked in past operations that Marines have been referred to as State Department troops in past campaigns. Legendre's mission was so successful that indeed in October 1873 another shipwreck occurred and the Paiwan tribes under the leadership of Toki Tok took the survivors in and treated them with forbearance if not kindness until Mr. Pickering again arrived to facilitate their safe return from Aboriginal lands. On this occasion, every hospitality was shown them and they were treated as honoured guests. Banquets were lavished upon them, possibly because they'd been shown the due respect as the masters of their domain. The Paiwan showed the kind and hospitable side of their unique character, and this is in stark contrast to their portrayal as nothing more than savages intent on headhunting and consumption of long pig. In 1874, a vessel from Okinawa was wrecked on the west of the Hung Chun Peninsula and the victims made it ashore and were initially treated as honored guests. However, due to some misunderstanding or miscommunication, that all turned sour and all 66 of the Okinawans ended up dead, with 54 of them being beheaded. This prompted the Japanese government to repeat Bell's mistake of 1867, deciding upon a punitive raid to avenge what the Empire called the Mudan Incident and a Japanese invasion of Taiwan. That's a big topic which is quite well told, so we're going to skip that in this video. Again, the imperial forces of Japan and China got to write this history, and again it paints the Paiwan as savage beasts that needed to be tamed by the civilizing forces of surrounding empires. At the same time, it paints Okinawans as being slightly less primitive, but somehow Japanese, and therefore their murder was an affront to Japan. Now my take on this is that Japan, having recognized Taiwan's strategic importance, decided to probe the Qing's grip on the island in a longer term plan to annex it. 
Interestingly, it was Legendre who, having gone to work for the Meiji government, advised the foreign minister on the invasion of Taiwan. Around this time, the town of Lianqiao, which is now called Hengchun, was walled as a defense against raids from these savages, which largely, largely occurred be simply because Chinese settlers wouldn't pay rent or dowries due to aboriginals. Strife between the aboriginals and especially the Hakka population was widespread and well documented. This fascinating read from 1876 is a glimpse into that. There's a link down in the description. The raid was useful to the Qing administration because it allowed them to further secure the island against Japanese incursion. Of course, not even 20 years later, the Qing court ceded Taiwan to the Empire of Japan in perpetuity in the Treaty of Shimonoseki. Rather splendid gate was added to the wall uh, around 1875. The, uh, the stonework is in the style of, of southern uh, Inland or southern Fujian, uh, these narrow bricks. The, uh, the stonework is, is much more uh, crude, heavy stones and uh, mortar to hold them together. The extra pavilion on top was added during the Japanese era. The, um, the arch itself, or part of it, and definitely the pavilion uh, on top, was destroyed or, and badly damaged in the year 2006 uh, by a strong earthquake. Taiwan is quite prone to uh, strong earthquakes, and was rebuilt uh, around 2008 again in the in in the style of the Japanese period. Later in the Japanese period, a railway line ran from Hangzhou down to Namwan. So there was even a railroad track that ran through the gate here. So you can imagine how busy it was. 